This morning we are thinking about how you and me, the church, the body of Christ, needs to impact the lives of others. How we need to be that godly influence on those who are around us. You know, sometimes we think, well, how can I make any difference in the grand scheme of this world for the sake of Christ? That's not what my message is about, and that's really not what the Lord's sermon was about either. You know, we can look on the big scale and think, there are influencers for Christ in the world, but that's not really me. You know, I think of the impact of Billy Graham and uh, how he shared the gospel, preached the gospel, lived it so faithfully, so well for so many years. And we think of all the many people that have come to personal faith through his, his ministry. And it's wonderful, but that, that's not me. And now his son, Franklin Graham, right, picks up that ministry and carries it his own way. And Samaritan's Purse is a big piece of that, what he does. Christian influencers of society. I think we realize athletes are all influencers, and I thank, am thankful for Christian athletes who share their testimony and live their testimony, influencing others. But that's not me. And I think we can find a few outspoken Christian entertainers, right, that seek to make a difference in their community. I just recently watched the movie Amazing Grace. It came out about 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And it uh, deals with the hot topic of slavery. And it centers on connections. And this morning, I want us to see that our connections with others will impact lives for eternity. And we see that in the true story of William Wilberforce. William Wilberforce was uh, tied in with the writer of the beloved hymn, Amazing Grace, John Newton. And he was a former slave owner, and trader rather. The movie takes us to British Parliament Tarian Wilbur, uh, William Wilberforce. And he comes to faith in Jesus Christ when he is in his 26th year of life. As a parliamentarian in England, he worked against the evils of slavery. It comes out really well in that film. But who influenced Wilberforce as a child because of the death of his father and his older sister, and the sickliness of his mother, he was shipped off to be with his aunt and uncle. And their lives were spiritually impacted by the Wesleys, John the theologian, Charles the hymn writer. And they, as a family, were close to the preacher George Whitfield. He was a part of the Great Awakening. And in their home, where Wilberforce was as a child, John Newton would visit and and, and, and he met him. And it was John Newton who came to faith in Jesus, leaving his slave trading past. And he becomes a pastor, and he becomes a hymn writer. And one of those hymns is, Amazing Grace has saved a wretch like me. After Wilberforce's new birth experience, he reconnected with John Newton, who continued in his life, impacting William's life. This is all about connections, and I want you to see that. All the influencers that were in his life because of the gospel. And you and I need to think the same. How have people influenced my life? How can I influence the lives of others for the sake of the gospel? I don't know about you, but I know I don't influence the world. But I know that You and I can impact those we live with, those we work with, those that we may go to school with. Indeed, please take your, again, I need you to take your outline, and and I want you to look at the opening portion again, and and I'd love for you to look through these five questions, talk about them as a family at home. The first question is, you know, who 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 have been your spiritual influencers, and how have they influenced your life? And the second question, take a look back in your life. If you come to know Jesus as a teenager or beyond, right? I came to Christ as a little child. But for those of you, who who was a Christ influence in your life before you came to know Jesus? You should write that down. And you should contact that person if you can. Three, as a believer who influenced your Christian walk. 
through the different stages of your life, different ways, right? I had fun writing that one out. Number four, who's in your circle of influence that you can impact for Jesus? Jot some names down. Two, three names. And the true application for this morning is the fifth one. How can you specifically influence them this week? There's your task. We all need to be spiritual influencers or others for the glory of God. The message that Jesus preached on that particular hillside on that particular day to a particular group of people who were followers of his in some way, Matthew has translated it from Aramaic into Greek, and he only gives us the highlights of that sermon where Jesus calls his followers to live distinctively different from their world. As Pastor Corey took us through the opening of the Lord's Sermon Jesus was describing the character of his followers, those who believed in him. By the time Matthew writes his gospel, some 30 years later, the church has indeed been birthed and has grown. And what he writes in the sermon for Jesus that he has gave back in that day needs to resonate in their lives in the church and our lives in the church. Jesus now shifts from character to function. And we can't miss this call for you and me to permeate into our community, into our society, to impact those around us for Christ's sake, to be the influencers on them for the sake of the kingdom. We read our text, and we see Jesus calls us to be salt and light, influencers of others for salvation. Take a look at the end of your outline. <clears throat> There's two more questions there. <laughs> you got a lot of work. And just the second one. And again, it practically, you know, how can you be the light of Christ to your circle of influence? And then what specifically, what specific good deeds could you do in their lives to influence them for Jesus? We got to think about that. We need to act on that so that they would come to know Jesus and they would surrender their life to Christ just like you did. Because someone influenced you for the kingdom. So how do we do that? That's the text. How do we do this? Point one, right? We've got to function as salt in a decaying world. Now for that to happen, point A, we need to know our function. And the function to be salt is to be a preservative. How's that for who you are? We're preservatives, right? Jesus so clearly declares that we, his followers, are the salt of the earth. The significance of salt is seen out through the ages. And its main purpose is to function as a preservative. Until the day of refrigeration, salt was the number one preservative. While losing, although those living before the 1800s, uh, they, they didn't know about bacteria, but they certainly knew about decay. And meat decays, meat spoils, meat turns rotten. And mankind learned the value of salt. Salt would be rubbed into the meats, and it could then be edible for a long period of time. Salt indeed slowed down the decaying process. It was an antiseptic. From our text, we certainly see that Jesus isn't asking us to be salt. He's declaring that we are salt. We're preservers. And that's what we are. Well, we have a purpose in our society, you and I, and in our community, and it's to stop or slow down the decaying process that's happening all around us, which we see and we're living in. Point B, we see the need for salt. And if its main purpose or value is to preserve meat for us, to preserve a society... That tells us a society needs salt. It needs to be preserved, to be kept from decaying, or at least to slow down that rotting process. And Jesus says, you are salt. Right? You're the salt of the earth. That declaration implies what? The need for salt. Salt is needed. Look at the next phrase, right? But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Right? Great statement. What's that tell us? It tells us that it's salt is the qualities, has the qualities that we need. 
So what's the need? As never before, I think, in our nation, as far as my life is, but it's just my generation of life, we see it quickly turning away from the word of God without question. Now, there's always been, society's always been in a state of decay. That goes back to Genesis chapter 3 with the fall of man. It's been in decay ever since. When sin entered the world through Adam. And yet you and I know there are times in history, even in, in our country, in Europe, of great awakenings. But far more so, we see the times past, present, where society truly is rotting very quickly. We look at the history of our nation. I don't know if we've ever been morally more depraved than we are today. I, certainly not in my lifetime. Therefore, there's never been a time when the church, as committed followers of Jesus, we need to smile here, we need to be saltier. <laughs> okay, now think about that. Salt can't be any saltier. But that is just what Jesus said, right? That's what he said. Which means what? We have to be more effective. That's what he's talking about. We have to be effective in being salt. We don't need to talk about the lostness of society, the decay of our of our world. It's evidenced all around us. Therefore, the need for salt is all the greater. Point C. We need to understand the means of fulfilling our purpose. If we can see how rotting away our society is, you know, if we think it's bad in America, it's probably worse in Europe, yet let alone other spots around this world, we will we'll see our need for salt. The, our world is decaying away. And thus the Lord calls us, the body of Christ, Jesus does, be salt. You are the salt of the earth. We are to slow down that decaying process. So how do we carry out that purpose? Point one, we've got to rub ourselves into the meat of our society. Do we see that? We've got to rub ourselves in. We've got to infiltrate into every fiber of this nation that we live in, our community right where we are. We cannot pull away and isolate ourselves away. We have to permeate in to be a preservative to a rotting society. Now, for sure, we're not to join in. Hey, let's smoke a joint. Yeah, pass it over here, and I'll tell you how much Jesus loves you. I don't think so. Peter writes, 1 Peter chapter 4. He says, in your past, as a non-believer, you live long enough Right? Don't live like that anymore. You were rotten. And since your sinful friends don't know Jesus, they're going to say, come and join with us in a wasted way of living. But we're not going to do that. And yet, we certainly must be out among the lost of our society. Can I remind you of the Lord's Prayer that Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane just hours before he was going to be crucified, and he prayed for his disciples in that prayer. And he said, my prayer is not, Father, that you would take my disciples, that you would take them out of the world, but that you would protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, and even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them or set them apart as holy in, by your truth. Your truth. Your word is truth. As, I, as you sent me into the world, I send them into the world. And that needs to be true of us. There's no question that we're to get rubbed into the very fiber of our society. Think about it. How can that work? How can you do that? How can you get into it? But we're not to live the way of society that is rotting away. So what do we do? We have to live carefully. We have to live thinkingly. So that we're not contaminating our lives as we live among the contaminated among those that need Jesus as their Savior. Certainly, we're, again, not to withdraw from society. Just the opposite. For salt to be effective, it has to permeate or be rubbed into the meat. And it's then that we're taking Jesus into our society. It's then that people will see Jesus in us, for we represent him. They will see the difference between but they'll see the difference that Jesus has made in our lives. 
And they will then see around us, right? They, they, they see as we take those opportunities to serve Christ before them so that they can respond to the gospel, hear the gospel, embrace Jesus just like you embrace Jesus. Point two, we have to keep our distinctiveness as we live in our community. And that's not easy. I know that. You know that. We've got to be careful that we're not contaminated ourselves. We think of the fight of COVID. And I think of our health professionals, you know, and let's go back to March or April, and they're in the hospital, and there's masses of people in some hospitals, and, and they had to protect themselves with as much protection as they could to keep from getting, picking up that same virus. That's how we have to live our lives, the same, with care. We gotta get this, as long as we're salt, we're protected. Does that make sense? As long as we're salt, we are protected. You know, we know that, we know that all the more as in the last 150 years or so, we've known why salt preserves. Salt draws the water out of the microorganism that it contacts, and therefore that organism, microorganism dies without water. As long as we are salty, as long as we are taking the gospel, speaking the gospel, living the gospel before others, showing Jesus Christ before others, then, then, then we're protected for ourselves from the contamination, right? I mean, that's what salt does. But if we lose our edge, if we lose our saltiness, we have no longer a value to the kingdom. Again, salt can't lose its saltiness, Yet that's what the Lord said. And what Jesus is saying is that we lose our effectiveness for the sake of the kingdom. We're no longer good for anything, Jesus said, except to be thrown out and trampled by, by people, right? That, that's what Jesus said. In the past, salt was recovered from salt marshes. And thus it contained many impurities. impurities. And, and the salt... Being more soluble than the impurities, it could be leached out. And so the, leaving a residue that was diluted, uh, so it was of very little value. And thus, they took it and they'd throw it out, mix it with the soil. It could become hard and packed, and they'd often do that on their flat roofs. So what is Jesus saying? We've got to keep our distinctiveness being salt, to work in our community, to retard the decay, to slow it down as a preservative. We do that by living our lives wholly to the Lord. It's an application point D. To be salt, we've got to keep our edge in our community so that we bump into people. We bump into people so much so they go, hmm, you're really salty. <laughs> right? Wouldn't that be great? Hmm. Too much salt, they might say. When people, when we're in the same space with others, our workspace, our living space, students in your class space, and, 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 and wherever you are, we've got to be influencing people for the gospel. And you and I have to think that through. Maybe you walk in and they stop their filthy language because you just walked in, or they stop some juicy story they were telling about their sexual exploits over the weekend. That's being effective as salt. How do, we, how do we stay distinctive, salty? We've got to stay in constant contact with the master salt block. We have to be keeping ourselves in contact, right? We're doing that, taking in the word of God, living the word of God, letting it saturate into our hearts and minds, and then we live it out. We've got to keep our commitment to Christ foremost. We always got to be committed, living committedly. And we do that when we'll not compromise our stand for Jesus Christ. Salt as a preserver. We don't become decayed ourselves. Rather, we become unuseful for the Savior. Let's not be unuseful for him. Jesus paid the ultimate price, decaying on our behalf, dying, so that we could have life. Being salty, we've got to be distinctive. Now, being distinctively different means we're going to be holy and pure. So much so, if you're living a real salty life, 
That could be taken in a very bad way, couldn't it? But biblically, if we're living a very salty life, what might you face because of that? Do you wonder, do you think maybe when Jesus is in the Beatitudes, closed the Beatitudes with blessed are you and people insult you, persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for as they persecuted the prophets before you. And then what's the next phrase that he says? You are the salt of the earth. Do you think there's a wonder? If you're living for Christ in the way of salt that you're going to be persecuted for his namesake? Well, not only are we to function as salt, but point two, we're to function as light in a darkened world. How do we do that? Well, point A, same thing, got to know our purpose. So what's our purpose? Our purpose is to be seen, not hidden away. Point one, what are we? We're the light of Christ. Look at verse 14. He says, you are the light of the world. And, and what's the purpose of light, right? It, it, it's to allow us to see, to see what they need. To, to see where they need to go, to, to see the danger that is around them so they can escape that danger. Point two, what's our purpose? It's to help people see. Jesus said a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. No, it's not going to be hidden. If it's built on a, on a hill, it's going to be exposed. If you want to hide away, you build it in the midst of a forest. You build it underground. But it could be visualized 360 all the way around. Because if it's up on a hill and it's nighttime and they've all got their lamps lit, you're going to see the town. Our purpose as believers is to be seen with the light of Jesus by those of this world. We can't hide ourselves away. We're to give light. You know, to, to hide a light it would be to, total contradiction. You don't hide a light. I guess you just wouldn't light the light, right? Or you'd blow the light out. You wouldn't hide it and keep it burning. Look at verse 15. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand. It gives light to everyone in the house. It's to be seen. You and I, we can't hide away from the lost of this society. The moment we cease to function with the light of Christ, we no longer have value just like the salt. What do you do with your old light bulbs? Oh, you put them in your old lamps, don't you? No, you throw them out. At least the old kind we could throw out. Point three. What's our function as believers as the body of Christ? It's to shine the light of Christ, all that he is. What does the light of Christ do? That's point A. It exposes darkness, right? Light exposes. You're in a dark room. You don't know what's in front of you. So you turn on the light so you can see. The followers of Jesus, we're to be that light in a dark world that exposes the sin of this world. We're also, the, in a positive way, we are providers. Light provides. Light provides what we need so we can see. It can, it can provide help and it provides guidance and it provides comfort and it, light takes away our fears and we can do that with others. How, you know, were any of us afraid of the dark when we were little? You know, I was and, you know, my folks... I, They'd leave the hall light on and kind of just close our door. So it took away a fear. Light can do that. It's a help. It provides for people. It gives confidence to people. We need to do that for others. B, being the light of Christ, we show forth all that Jesus is to needy people. People who need to know Jesus as their Savior. They're not going to find it through the world's literature, through the world's philosophies, through the world's culture. People are going to find Jesus only through his word and you and me being salt and light. We're going to reflect the light of Jesus. We're going to reflect his holiness and purity. We're going to reflect his kindness. We're going to reflect his way in which to go. Point B, we see the need for light because the world is in darkness. That's point one. Jesus declared that we, his followers, are light. Obviously implying that the world needs us because the world is dark. We also know that the world doesn't see themselves in darkness, right? I'm sure before you, if you came to know Jesus as a savior, as an adult, you would not probably, most of us, would not have described ourselves as living in a darkness. You would have thought you were very enlightened, you were very progressive, you were very smart and with it. You know, enlightenment, it goes back to the, what, the 15th, 16th centuries, the 18th century is called the, the, the age of enlightenment. And we know how 
wisdom, or not wisdom, but knowledge of mankind is growing. We know more today than ever before. Like, duh. But you think of, from last century into this century, think of the advancements from, from space to the test tube. And a computer used to take up big space, and now it's tiny. It's amazing the advancements that we have in medicine and on and on. You know, and you think we're living in darkness? What's wrong with you? Yeah, we're li- the world is in darkness, spiritual darkness, facing eternal death. Not only is the world in darkness, but point two, individuals are in darkness. It's hard for people to look at themselves and say, I'm living in darkness. They can't see the evil that they're doing. Apostle John wrote in the third chapter of his gospel, he said, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of the light because their deeds are evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be what? Exposed. No one wants exposure. The sexual scandal out there, it becomes a scandal because it was discovered. The embezzlement that takes place is because it's been discovered. Everyone wants to hide the crime and hide the sin. We all want to hide our sin. And the light exposes it. People don't want exposure. But point three, Jesus is the light of the world. He called himself that in John chapter 8, verse 12. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of, there it is, life, real truth, which stands in contrast to this world. People who think they have such a great light of knowledge and human, human uh, achievements. But their light, the light of this world, is, like, is compared to a pen light. Now, this is pretty light in this room. You really can't even see this. But what if... What if you're driving in your car down on Cleveland Avenue down to Baroda and it's midnight, it's pitch black, there's no lights on, the, the, there's no moon, it's really dark and your lights aren't working and you're just holding out your pen light. How good are you going to get there? Let alone the car in front of you is going half your speed with a pen light. What results in that? Crash bang. That's this world's light. The light of the world has come. The problem is people have their eyes closed and they refuse to look. Point four, the believer is Christ's reflected light. Where is reflected light? Now in our text, Jesus said he is the light of the world, right? But then we've just read that he has said you are the light of the world. God is the source of light. Christ is and he beams his light out through us. You know that, I know that. It's exactly what Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 5. He says, once you were darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. Therefore, what? Live as children of the light. And he describes what that looks like. Goodness and righteousness and truth. That's how we have to live. Point C, we see the means of fulfilling our purpose. It's by doing good in our community. Verse 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus defines that light as doing good works, good things. Peter writes similarly, uses the same words in the Greek, 1 Peter chapter 2, live such good lives or noble lives or upright lives, engaging lives. Among the pagans, the lost, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your good deeds and glorify your day on the day he visits, right? Jesus said the same thing. Paul expressed God's purpose in us in Ephesians chapter 2. For you are God's literally poem. You are God's poem created in Christ Jesus to what? Do good works. Why? Which God prepared in advance to do. We're to do good things out in our community. Why do we do it? Point D. We've got to understand the result of fulfilling our purpose. And it will result in, what did Jesus say? People giving praise to God. Eventually, isn't that nice to know? The good things that you do in their lives, eventually they have to result by saying, praise you, God. Whether that's on the day of judgment when they have to own up or when they more likely have come to know Christ as their Savior and they thank God because of you. Application point eight. Let's think through this practically. What does it mean to be the light of Christ in a dark world? 
Back to the outline. These two questions, last two questions. You know, and I, 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 how do you describe the darkness? How would you describe the darkness of lost people? I think we need to come to that point. Think about it. And then secondly, what are those practical ways that we can, in our circle of influence, can do good deeds for them? What are some specific good deeds that you could do this week? What could you do to show them, point them to Jesus? I want to give you some history of the early church as you think about that. First three centuries and the impact that Jesus had on the world. The information comes from one of my favorite books, The Rise of, of Christianity by Rodney Starks. And uh, he's a professor. He, he attributes one aspect of growth of Christianity in how Christians handle the two devastating epidemics in the second and third centuries. Many Christians made a world of difference then. Many Christians have made a world of difference with COVID. We need to keep it up. In 165, during the reign of Marcus Aurelius, Pastor Corey mentioned him last week in, in the burning to the stake of Philistia and, and her seven sons, right? Remember that? Well, during his reign, most likely, it was smallpox that was this devastating disease, and it ripped through the Roman Empire, killing a fourth or to a third of the Roman Empire, including the emperor himself. Then in 251, a new equally devastating epidemic, it probably or possibly measles, did the same. And through this disease, Christianity grew. At the height of the first plague, 5,000 people a day were reported to have died in the city of Rome. Professor Stark wrote that Christians responded to the needs of the sick with collective action. The pagan priests fled cities, the highest civil authorities, and the aristocrat rich left as well. It was Christians that really gave meaning to life and to death. Paganism didn't do that. In the height of the second plague in 260, what did the Christians do? Many Christians died, but many Christians stayed and helped and served. They worked with the dying and the sick, believer and unbeliever. And they ministered to those believers and unbelievers in the name of Jesus. Dr. Stark wrote, Stark wrote that, that it's possible not only did God answer prayer, but their immune system kicked in as well because they were in, giving themselves exposure. Bishop Dionysius of Alexandria wrote a lengthy tribute to the heroic nursing efforts of local Christians. He wrote, and you can read it, right? He describes how the Christian community nursed the sick and the dying, even that, that even spread. Nothing kept them from even preparing for the dead and proper burial. He went on to write that the heathens behaved in the opposite way. They pushed the sufferers away and fled from their dearest, throwing them into the rows before they were even dead. A century later, Emperor Julian launched a campaign to, to institute pagan charities in an effort to match Christians. You know, what does that say? And the emperor com c complained in a letter that he wrote to his high priest of Galatia, that part of Asia, in 262. And the pagans needed to equal the virtues of Christians for recent gr Christian growth that... that um, was caused by their, quote, moral character, he wrote, even if pretended, <laughs> and by their, quote, benevolence towards strangers and care for the graves of the dead. He also wrote, quote, the impious Galatians, uh, Galileans, rather, support not only their poor, but ours as well. Everyone can see that our people lack aid from us. Many pagan survivors own their life to the Christians who were their neighbors. And the result of those good deeds, many pagans put their faith in Jesus and Christianity grew because they saw the tangible love of Jesus. We've got to be salt. We've got to be light to a dark world. How can we do it specifically? What do, good deeds can we do? How can we make an impact for Christ? I'll share you a brief story and then we close. Back when I was a youth pastor, that was during my seminary days, Glen Ellen Bible Church, Glen Ellen, Illinois. Within the four years that I ministered there, two girls came to know Christ as their Savior, a Sue M. and a Betsy Page. And they went off to the University of Illinois, and it was freshman orientation week, and they both went out and got drunk. And they came back, and Sue M. said, that's how I'm going to live, and she lived that way. She dumped her faith, had no clue what happened to Sue. 
But Bessie Page, she said, I can't live that way for Jesus. So she got involved with crew. And in her freshman year, she and others led a number of women to the Lord. And in their dorm, for their sophomore year, they said, how can we strategically place ourselves in our part of the wing of that dorm on that floor? I would have been going, let's all huddle up and be close to each other. And they spread themselves out. They led more girls, more women to Christ. And so by the end of their sophomore year, they streamed, they plotted, how are we going to impact our whole wing or the whole floor for Jesus? And they spread out again, strategically planning. That's amazing. And Betsy went on to be a missionary in the Philippines. Her life turned around, impacting how many other women for Jesus Christ? Right there. That's what we got to do. We're called to be salt and light for the sake of the gospel, to make a difference. I think right here in our community, there's ways to be involved to make a difference with that slide, to be salt and light. There's many ways that we can make a difference in the lives of others. Be involved. Right here at the chapel as we get back to normal sometime in the future. Or has hands ministry where you can go do some practical things for others. Sometimes Christians, sometimes not Christians. We have our CIA day as we minister to ministries in our community that minister to those in need. There's global media outreach. There's 11 of us who are missionaries. They're trained to use their keyboards for the sake of the gospel. Marion Douse is one of the pieces of leadership in global media outreach. And and, and how many have come to know Christ? And it's not like you have to go out to evangelize, but you've got people who are saying, I want more information through the Internet. And they contact, and you answer them, and you have a dialogue through through, through your typing with them. We currently, I'm so thankful for, for those at close to your home who, who are foster care parents. And you take care of foster children, making a difference in those lives, maybe for eternity. You've been faithful giving to benevolent fund that is being used to meet needs of those around us. Some of you are teaching and working with our children and, and ministering and, and, and with our students, and I thank God for you, and we probably could use some more of you. And, how about next summer, we VBS, let's plan to have VBS and have it here and have it live. And maybe you could sign up and say, I want to be a part of that because the gospel is clearly given through VBS and children come to know Jesus. Do something. Coach your child's soccer team, baseball team. Get on and serve on the PTO board in, your, in our schools. At work, volunteer to be the chairman of that subcommittee that no one wants to do anything because it's a lot of work. But you do it. Make a difference. We can make a difference to be salt and light. Let's bow for prayer. Heads bowed. I want you to think and I want you to pray. And to us as believers, first I want you just to renew your heart to be salt and light. Pray that to the Lord. Talk to Jesus to renew your heart to be salt and light. And then secondly, I want you praying for just another minute or two. How you can specifically point people to Jesus. How you can be salt and light to them through specific actions. Will you pray about that? Or maybe some here this morning in this room or some are watching online. And, and maybe you've been impacted by another person as salt and light. Maybe you haven't, but you know your need for Jesus. He is the life giver. He points us the way. He is the way. And by faith in him, our lives can be turned around. We can have new life in him. If that's your need this morning, right now I invite you to Respond and take him and receive him as your Savior and Lord. Silently, you can pray and say, Jesus, I understand that you are the Savior. You died on that cross to pay for my sin, my rot. And I'm asking you to forgive me, to cleanse me. Right now, Jesus, I take you and receive you as my Savior. If that's your prayer this morning, please let me know, any of our staff, any of our pastors, we want to pray with you, talk with you. We're going to close and sing a song that I've come to love, and it's about who Jesus is. It reminds us that he is the way maker, that he makes the way. He's the miracle worker. He's the promise keeper. And then our passage, he is the light in darkness. As we draw close to him, we can make those same kind of ways for those around us, if we would. Because Jesus has done that for us. Let's stand and sing as we close this morning.